Hello and welcome to Five Year Club video number 207. And uh, here we have the artwork displayed for uh, the story that I'm going to read tonight. It's called Showers of Zinni. It is the third story in the, what is it, fourth book Yep, of the Japanese Family Storehouse, a 333-year-old uh, text from Japan translated in 1959 um, that talks about kind of little anecdotes and then what those anecdotes mean about um, how you should think about um, money and business and work in your life. And I don't agree with everything in this book. I just think the book is fun to read because it contains a bunch of crazy old Japanese stuff and sometimes there's also a good lesson to it. So, get me a blackberry. Mm. That was a good one. That's probably the best one. I got these monster blackberries from Cheddar Joe's. I got to go back tomorrow and get as many of these as I can because they're amazing. Look at look at this one. This freaks me out. This, that, oh shit. No, I shouldn't use that word. I, I didn't want to drip water on this book because the book was very difficult to find. So that is a huge freaking blackberry. Oh my God. All right, let's go. Showers of Zenny. Honest dealing among men is a tradition which originated in Ice, the province of the gods. Besides the two main shrines at I at Ice, of course, there are 120 flimsy-looking side shrines, each of which displays a picture of its god on a paper poster. These shrines are not in the best of taste, perhaps, but in the hearts of the deities themselves, as in their crystal mirrors, there is no trace of deceit. In the selves, as in their, uh, in the attendants' hearts too, there is nothing but innocence and purity, and it is in this knowledge that people from every quarter of our land of autumn harvests make the pilgrimage to ice. But who, one wonders, was the petty-minded genius who started the custom of pigeon's eyes, those curious lead zinni which are sold to pilgrims. 60 on a hundred string, as offering money on their tour. What stingy creatures men are. The wealthy gods of luck would laugh outright at such an offering. The business done at this place, I need hardly say, is a roaring one. Contributions flow in without a moment's pause. Mountains of gold and silver for ritual dances. Thousands of dozens of monme for answers to prayers. Souvenir dealers making their lives by selling toy whistles, seashell spoons, and edible seaweed are as countless as the men without private scribes. Pay as any a copy to anyone who will write out the routine New Year messages they must carry around to their patrons in the provinces. And there are hundreds of people who support wives and families throughout the year by this alone. No one fails to get a living of some sort here. Salesmanship by courting the customer is the specialty of the people of Ice Province. Even the female beggars along the Ainoyama Road are patient practitioners of this art, and by making eyes at every passing pilgrim, they never go cold or hungry. Dressed in gay silks, strumming samisens in time with their neighbor, they sing their one and only song, Oh, how sad to be single. No one has ever heard them sing a new one, and the three-mile road from the outer to the inner shrine would lose its special flavor if they did. A zinni is a delightful thing. No one had ever given these beggars their fill of them, though crowds of pilgrims had passed their way. It's a small enough sacrifice and you would think that someone would feel the urge to make us happy, grumbled one old man, a vendor of souvenir pebbles. Kyoto people give fantastic New Year tips at the Shimabara brothels, but when they come here, they're the stringiest of the lot, stingiest of the lot. Once a certain townsman from Edo made the pilgrimage to ice. His baggage, strapped on a hired mule, was of no particular distinction. The cushions in his palanquin were of the plainest purple. 
and his attendants numbered no more than two or three. One of the usual pilgrim agents had been entrusted by him with all the arrangements for his visit. By leaving Yamada for the inner shrine, the merchant bought 200,000 zenny of genuine copper, which he set across the backs of a team of light baggage mules, and as he moved along the twenty-odd furlongs of the Aino Yama road, he scattered the coins in every direction. The surface of the highway disappeared from sight, and as you might have, have thought that every tree by the wayside was the celebrated pine of a million zenny. The surface of the highway disappeared from sight, and you might have thought that every tree by the wayside was the celebrated pine of a million zenny. Okay, that is a lot of coins. The beggars rose from their haunches and gathered all they could till zenny overflowed from capacious Matsubara dancing sleeves or dripped over the rims of bean paste sieves. For a moment, their singing and strumming was stilled. They wondered what sort of a millionaire this man could be, and they asked the attendants his name. It was Fundoya or something or other, they gathered, and he lived somewhere near Sai Sakaicho in Edo. He was one of those rich men of whom no one ever hears. The world offers many examples of shaky businesses blown up to daimyo proportions, but with this man the case was reversed. Behind an unimpressive facade he concealed a fortune with such massive solidity that one might sooner catch slippery demons in the dark than budget an inch. That's, that's our quote for this book, for this chapter, I think. One might sooner catch slippery demons in the dark than budget an inch. That car is totally stuck in the mud. And one might sooner catch slippery demons in the dark than budget an inch. Spring after spring, luck had kept the devils from his door. And now, after making his own way in the world for 34 years, from 21 to 55, he had retired and passed on to his only son a capital of 7,000 Rio. His initial venture in trade had been to rent a three-yard wide stall near the Miyako Denai Theater and set up a zenny shop to provide small change for purchasers of sideshow tickets. When weighing customers' silver, he allowed himself a commission of a half to one fun in every two or three monmei, and, although his trade at first gave trifling returns, as his capital slowly grew, he was able to make much larger profits. In time, he rose to be a fully-fledged money broker. He was truly as sound as a camphor tree, and nothing could shake the foundations of his fortune. Next door to his zenny shop, there had lived an extremely clever showman, a man who could pass off a crow as a white heron. One year, when he exhibited a bird, bird of hell, of consummate workmanship, his takings reached 50,000 zenny every day, in another year he made mountains of money from a queer-shaped thing which he named the Berabo Beast. But he was not the man to hurry and get himself a house and a store shed. He turned his mind instead to distant mountains and ocean gulfs, dreaming of the day when he should discover a monkey of a naturally pale blue complexion or a bream with hands and feet. Looking for his livelihood, he floated about like a bubble on a river, liable to burst and vanish at any moment. The takings of actors and boy players, too, are momentary blossoms which bear no fruit. In the kabuki play Visits to Kawachi, Tamagawa Sinojo, as the heroine, received a fixed salary for every performance of one gold koban, so that in a single year he made 360 ryo. But when he died in retirement in ice, he owned not so much as an old theatrical robe, and his only consolation in his old age had been the memory of his days of glory. He had had no conception of how to save money and use it for trade. A man must know his way about the world, whatever his calling. In the late year of the cock, when even pots and pans went up in smoke, everyone alike was obliged to start life again from naked poverty. But things were very soon exactly as before. The sake shops reappeared, 
with the familiar cedar brooms of the trade over their doors, and the drapers of Hancho were displaying materials as fine as ever. The Tin Ma Cho silk and cotton stores were rebuilt with the same distinctive shop fronts, and the street through Sakuma Cho was lined once more with its multitudinous purple paper merchants. Purple. Purple merchant. With its multitudinous paper merchants. Business in the Funocho fish market and the Komegashi rice market, the Amadana wholesale lacquer shops, and everywhere along Toricho was well on the way to the prosperity we know today. When the wind had dropped and the clouds were stilled, makers of clogs and sandals reappeared in the Furitericho silversmiths reappeared in Furitericho. Silversmiths <laughs> Japanese words. Silversmiths hammers were heard again in the Shirogane Cho and everywhere it was the same people one had seen before plying their same trades. The day laborers bodies, the beggars, the begging priests faces, the voices of vendors of ointments for boils and cuts, all were the old familiar ones. Not a single person, it seemed, had changed his mode of life. The old poor, even, were the new poor, and the old rich had become rich again. Fondoya toured the city after the fire, and he noted all this in amazement. In all the districts and stores in Edo, he said, only one man changed his trade. Perhaps he had picked up some capital in the fire. At any rate, he gave up the rosary business and had run all his life and opened... The rosary business he had run all his life and opened a sword and dagger shop in Nagabashi. He looked to have set himself up splendidly for life, but no customers came and his shiny new swords were soon as rusty as ancient kitchen knives. In time, he realized that rosaries were his only hope of salvation, and he returned to his old shop to pick up the broken threads of his livelihood. A man does well to keep to the path of life he knows. Okay, well, that is the final little moral of this story. A man does well to keep to the path of life he knows. And keep in mind that this was written in like a caste system, um, medieval. It's not actually medieval. It's like a, a feudal, which was only apparently 333 years ago. Japan, Showers of Zinni. So the title is referring to this guy who was really successful. Um... And uh, as a money changer, and he's stuck with being a money changer. And then it goes uh, into all of these people who, you know, suffered in a fire and then started up again. And he said that almost nobody changed, and the one guy who did change got screwed. So if you keep working at the same thing and stick with it, you have a better chance of being rich. That's the moral of this story. I don't think this guy knew that much about Silicon Valley. Because... In Silicon Valley, what do they say? They say fail fast so that you can start up a new company that uh, hopefully is a better idea. Who knows? Anyway, that is video number 207. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Showers of Zinni, right? That's the name of it. Showers of Zinni. Yep. And now I'm going to do the next story. But uh, don't change that channel.